Yes. Okay. Yes. This one is organic, and I was able to mix it. Oh, I'd like to make all the No, uh, because uh, you see, uh, that problem is only occurring with water-based paints yeah. because the water, the water is uh, kind of dense. So it's making hard. When something is dense, like a concrete block, it's harder to have something penetrate inside as opposed to something which is not dense, then it's easier to mix. So of course, with the oil and with the encaustic and with all the oil-based techniques, you're never going to have that problem. So yes. the inorganics you mix directly with the water and the organics mix directly with the oil? Yes. Okay. Yes. And the organics will also mix directly in the alcohol. Yes. Yes. There you go. And they'll mix in water if you add a little salt to them. Wait, the organic? Mixes okay. in okay. water if you add a little salt to them. That's what they do when they are making artist uh, acrylic paints. When they are making a vat of color, they are using a lot. So they are putting the pigment, putting the water, and putting the surface surfactant agent, whatever, to make that that kind of slurry, and then they will add the binder to the very end. Because when you are making paint, I don't believe I said that, but when you mix the pigment into the solvent, then you're doing disperse. You're dispersing the pigment, making it smaller. And as the pigment gets more and more dispersed, your paint gets uh, stronger and stronger. Because if you are looking at this place, and I have a big aggregate of pigment, maybe I have four aggregates, and that's my color. But imagine if I break it down into eight aggregates in the same space, but eight smaller ones, then my color gets more vibrant. So you can see in my test, I did a fallow green here at the beginning of the demo from the dry pigments. And look at my, my inks, my carbazole right here. Do you see the power difference? Carbazole is a little bit is a little bit of a stronger pigment, but normally it should be in the same class as fallow green. But you see the dark, how much dark they have? This one has more is because it's more dispersed. So as you are grinding, basically the reason we are grinding is to get from this to this. In the pigment dispersion, the pigment has already been dispersed to the full. More than what we can do even with the glass, with the spatulas, or even with the model. Okay. So I put a little test here. Yes, you have a question. Could you add pigment to like acrylic tubes? Absolutely not. Yeah, or you could even go with aqua dispersion to acrylic tubes. Absolutely. When you say uh, color is more powerful, you're talking about tinting power. Right? Yes. That's what it means. Yeah, tinting power. Organics have higher tinting power. Yeah, organics have higher tinting power. Basically, the reason for this is, what do you think the reason for that would be? Why would a pigment have more tinting power than another pigment? Better molecular bond? <laughs> no. No. Think about this and eight of them. I don't have a blackboard. Ah, that's, that's my stuff. Four of them, four fists, pigment <laughs> uh, aggregates. Imagine I break each and every one of them into three. So that would be 12. Smaller ones. But if you walk away from it, you know that this color is going to be more intense. There are 12 dots of color, smaller ones, but 12, as opposed to uh, four big dots. That's tinting power. Why do you think a pigment has more tinting power than another pigment? Just because of them. Oh, sorry. Yes. Oh, um, organic can convert down easier, not metal. Absolutely. But basically what it is, Jess, is organic pigments are way smaller. They are small, very, very small. Even if you want to break down a cadmium pigment, mm -hmm. you can't go much. We never get to actually when we are grinding the paint, we never get to actually have each pigment individual, right? But cadmium pigments are measured, cadmium and inorganics like iron oxide, they are measured in microns, okay? Organic pigments are measured in nanometers. 
which is microns is basically, this is zero centimeters, and you got six digits. That's microns. You know, one micron is five zeros and one. But nanometers is a thousand times smaller. You have three extra zeros. That's very small. That's why organic pigments are stained, because they are small. So because they are smaller, when we grind them, of course, our square has more guts than cadmium. You can grind the cadmium down to, micron, uh, to a nanometer size, because then you are breaking down the molecule, because the molecule is micron size. So that's tinting power. If you have a pigment that has a high tinting power, it means, and I'm making this simple, of course it can be more complicated than that, but basically meaning is, it's a small pigment. The base particle is small. What are you using right now? Uh, I'm just adding a filler pigment to make more paint. Because uh, you picked up uh, an expensive one. <laughs> I can't get any more of it. Sorry. That's okay. <laughs> That's what always happens. So that's like what dries medium, sort of? Uh, the white pigment, right? What it is? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you guys know, for example, um, you know about zinc white and titanium white, right? One is, you know, uh, more opaque, one is more transparent. Uh, one has, you know, less covering power. If you mix the zinc white, you know, to make use, it doesn't, the color doesn't break down as fast, right? Filler pigments, what I'm using now, is, is a white pigment. It has a pigment number, it's a white, but it has less tinting power even than zinc white. Wow. <coughs> yeah, and titanium even. So we can use them, you know, in paints to make more paint but reduce the cost. Because for example, that green pigment uh, is maybe, I think we were selling this 150 bucks a pound. Wow. Uh, it, it's an expensive one. It was more expensive than others. And calcium carbonate chalk, or barium sulfate, which I'm using now, maybe it's $7 a pound. So if you're using a pound of each, you're getting more paint, but you're basically cutting the cost in half. Why is it that in the case of this one, uh, making a pigment, the price of pigment has to do, there's many factors. One is, um, what's the, what are we using to make it? For example, if you're making an iron-based pigment, there's a lot of iron ore everywhere. It's easy, cheap. So the cost of material for that one's going to be cheap. And if you're making that exact same process pigment, but you're using a cadmium, Cadmium ore is more expensive, so the resulting pigment, the cadmium, will be more. If it's like the same synthesis. Synthesis is uh, the, the process of you know, synthesizing the pigment because they are made in chemical factories and everything else. So we call a synthesis like when we make a chemical reaction and make the pigment. Now, in the case of organic pigments, they are more expensive because the synthesis uh, the base material is carbon, it's really cheap. But the synthesis to make it, that has many, many steps. And you need to have the qualified chemist there every strike, every time they do something to make sure that the reaction goes well and it's complicated. So that's what brings the price up. And in the case of this one, it's such an oddball color, there is no demand for it. Except for artists, of course, you're going like, what? But you're an artist, yeah, but you're not coloring Tupperwares. If you're making this kind of product, which is 90% of what the pigments are for, they're not, nobody makes pigments for artists. They're making pigments for these kinds of things, or this. So if you are making Tupperwares, why would you get, you know, that kind of color? They just get fallow blue. I bet you that's fallow blue inside of there. And fallow blue is super cheap because there's a big volume too. It's, it's probably less, com less complicated to make than this one, but also the volume of it is phenomenal. You know, 
when you see blue in a like your pencil sharpener, it's probably there's some foul blue in there as well. If it's plastic, you know, or ultramarine. So that's why. So it's the price of the the base material, the synthesis process, and the uh, the amount used worldwide. These are the three. So if more people would start demanding it, it they would make it. Absolutely. And it would be cheaper. What green is cheaper then? Or is green overall expensive? Uh, for example, cobalt green is, you know, well, it's, it's not so expensive to get cobalt green, though. So, and cobalt, um, fallow green is, of course, cheap. Not as cheap as fallow blue, but it's cheap. That's why you'll find, if you look your student grade paints, and you look all the greens they are giving you, it's all the time mixes containing fallow green, because fallow green is cheap. So when you know about the pigment numbers, fallow green is pigment green seven, then you can know about the tubes and what's in there and what it's going to behave like. About earlier, you know when you said you could mix the oil directly with the organic mm -hmm. pigment? Could you mix it directly with the inorganic pigment? We absolutely not. Okay. Because inorganic pigments are heavy. Yeah, well that's why we didn't try to mix it. I just want to put it a little bit here to show that the change. Now you see the consistency is a little better, but in the case of this pigment, we lost a little bit of the transparency and uh, the mass tone. In organic pigments, we always have mass tone and undertone. You guys know mass tone and undertone? No? For example, if you take cadmium red and you look at it full, or cadmium yellow, you look at it full, uh, full trend, opaque, it's going to be a color. And when you dilute that color, it's going to be the same color, just diluted. It's going to be that same yellow. It's not going anywhere else. Now, when you look at this one, okay, and you look at the mask on it, it's a green. But when you dilute it, it's a yellow. The mask on and undertone is different. For example, ultramarine blue. The one you can buy most of the time is the red shade ultramarine blue. When you dilute it, it has a purple quality to it. That you can guess, when you are looking at the mask tone, you can guess that. It's really subtle, but you can guess it looking at the mask tone. But you get the purple quality if you dilute it over a white background and you see that. Do you understand what I'm saying? So, uh, here what I'm losing is a little bit, the mask tone has become you know, more light, and I'm losing a little bit the transparency by adding a filler pigment. So you can make the paint like this or like that. And before I grind with the mower, I'm just going to add a little something else, which is beeswax, just to keep the paint in a nice paste form and to prevent the oil and pigment separation. Because as you know, in uh, paint tubes, oil paint tubes, you get a lot of that. You know, the oil separating from the pigment. So I'm just using a little bit about that much. What else do you have in that beeswax? Uh, turpentine to make it because, uh, of course, beeswax is like this, but that's not very convenient to put in oil painting. So we make a uh, cold wax medium, which is we added turpentine to it, melted the two together, and then put in there. To be well, actually, you don't melt them together. Uh, let me rephrase that. You melt the, the beeswax first. And when the beeswax is melted, you go away from the double boiler, whatever, and then you have your turpentine and you stir, and then you put it down. You don't add the turpentine while it's on the double boiler. Yeah. You just, first you melt the beeswax. When the beeswax is melted, okay, adding the turpentine will not make it re-solidify, because basically, if you're melting a pound of beeswax, which is 454 grams, you're going to basically use the same amount in mills of turpentine, so 500 mils, give or take. If you're using that recipe, you don't need to heat up the turpentine or anything. You can just put it in the wax and stir it, and it's going to be coming together. Can you substitute the turpentine with the minerals here? Absolutely, you can. I used to do it uh, for a customer, and uh, she said, I never done it for myself, so I don't know. But she said, though, that sometimes the, 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 the texture of the wax is a little funny when you do that. 
and uh, I was making for her uh, big quantities of this medium. And once we made it, and we only made it once, the second time she came back and she asked the person to make it. But definitely it's going to work with um, mineral spirits as well. It just might be the consistency, might be funny. Because mineral spirit and turpentine isn't the same kind of uh, solvents. You were talking earlier about the difference between zinc light and titanium light for their mixing properties. I don't think you finished that down. Oh, the mixing properties. Uh, I think the reason I was talking about that was because I wanted to talk about filler pigments. Or was it before? I we just started talking about it. And then what do you want to know about the uh, versus zinc? Well, I was just wondering, like, what um, you were saying that for zinc white, the color doesn't break down as well. Okay, that's good. Uh, basically, uh, zinc white and titanium white are your two basic whites if you're an oil painter today. Mm -hmm. When you're going to be buying tubes, it's basically going to be a mixture of the two or one or the other. Um, zinc white basically has less tinting power. It's more dense. If you have a pure tube of zinc white, you're going to find that it's very heavy. And because it has less tinting power, if you are doing portraits, for example, well, you need to have like as many tonalities as you can in a face, basically. Zinc white is kind of the way to go because it doesn't break down the color as fast, so you can get used more so. Sometimes with titanium, it's going to bring your color to a pastel shade almost right away, and then you need to add a lot of the pure color to get your tints. However, uh, there's been uh, some recent studies about oil painting with zinc white that uh, is showing that it's a pigment that would tend to crack over time, because... Uh, Which one? Zinc. Oh, yeah. It's, you can look it up, it's the Smithsonian in the U.S. that made the study. So, you know, many manufacturers, myself included, are thinking to probably rid ourselves of the zinc white in our use because if I make a U with zinc white, it's always more brilliant, more interesting than if I make it with titanium. But this new study being out, now we're reconsidering using it. So which white did you use again when you said you added it into your... Uh, this one? So which white was it? It was barium sulfate which is not a white that you guys are going to see in the tube because it really doesn't have a lot of tinting power. It's, it's also called blanc fix. It's just like to, to have, it's just like medium in a way. It's a filler. Yeah. I'm sorry. It's just to have like more paint in a way. That's right. Okay. It's a filler paint. I just used it to make more paint. Now the last part is uh, grinding. This is a traditional tool, but if you wanted to, you could do this just with the spatulas like I was doing. And as I'm grinding right now, basically what I'm doing is, I'm going from this, right, to ideally. Do you have to grind every time? When, you when, grind. I, was, when I was making my paints, oil paints and painting, <coughs> I never... Never. Always do with the spatulas like that. Yeah, like he did earlier. Yes. Like, you know, like this, and paint. But if you want to, you can grind. It's just making the color more intense. It depends on what you want to do, but you don't need to. Well, will we have to add something else to it after? Maybe like spread out. Just it's spreading out? Yeah, you just like use your palette. Oh, yeah, you're going to see. Basically, okay, I can keep on grinding like that. I take off, you know, from the side, and then I just go like this. Do you see the undertone is kind of coming out? You see yeah. yellow, green, mm -hmm. two colors, one pigment. It's not a mix, but it has a yellow undertone. It's a yellow undertone green. If it was a cadmium, it would be yellow and yellow. You get what I'm saying? Yeah. Okay. Organic pigments have undertone. Not only organics, but most mostly. So that's how you pick it up, basically. And then you just put it back, and you grind it. Up. 
How do you know when you're done grinding? <laughs> Myself, I never really ground. You can, you know, you grind them till, that's what I was saying in the first part. You grind them till you get the result. If you're seeing it's not changing, then, you know, you're you okay. But the thing is, it's important, for example, when you make a layer of paint, what's important is, if that's your canvas, okay, it mustn't be like big pigments, big lumps, and you know, a little bit finer. It has to be as even as possible. A good paint film will be a paint film where the pigments are encapsulated by the binder. That's what you want to do. But that you can do very well with just this. You know, as you're grinding it more, you're going to get, you're going to see from the true things. The color is going to become more vibrant. But I could have gotten this from the start if I wanted to. Too. So as you're making your paints, you're finding ways to do it. Also because the pigment used to come in a bigger powder form than it does now, so it was kind of necessary, I guess, uh, in the past to use a molar, but now because it's you know, so nicely produced that you can use a nice little yeah. like, similar quality paint. Because I have customers that grow, mm -hmm. I do. You know, I have all kinds of customers, but you guys are students. These guys make maybe two, three paintings a year. They are working traditional techniques, varnishes, whatever. So of course they grind. They make their own paint. They uh, document everything they do. But obviously that's not what you guys, that's not the way to take it from you guys, you know. You're more like, when I was a student in art school, 